Proverbs chapter number 21. Begin reading in verse number 2. The Bible says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is a sin. Now, to give our visitors a little recap, I like the book of Proverbs. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun. Right? The book of Proverbs tells us that Solomon, because he had a heart for the things of God and wanted to do right by God's people in God's eyes, that God blessed him with great wisdom. Right? And everything else that he could have asked for on top of it. But outside of the Lord Jesus, maybe the wisest man to ever walk in the flesh. Right? Well, if nothing new is under the sun, what's that mean? These things are just as true today as they are the day that Solomon received them from the Lord. Right, so verse number two, every way of man is right in his own eyes. I mean, there's a whole lot of ways you can try and explain it. Way I've <laughs> come to understand it, Brother Ray, is, is that I like me, and I like it when I'm right, and I don't like it when I'm wrong. So I've become very good at convincing myself that I'm right, regardless of what I'm doing. Right? I can argue with myself and convince myself of almost anything. Because right? it's me that I'm arguing against. I know the things I like to hear. I know the things I don't like to hear. And I only say those things into the mirror that I like to hear. Right? But if we want to take it one step further, right? we know that wherever a man's heart is, there's treasure will be also. Right, we're instructed that whatever you desire, that's what you're going to put your effort, you're going to put your time, you're going to put your money. That's where you're going to invest yourself. So here in the verse when he says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. It's not just saying the things that we do. Right, The way of the man is saying the way that you live your life is always going to be right in your own eyes. Unless you're confronted by something else it could be correction by another it could be holy ghost pulling and convicting your heart but left to your own devices you're always going to think that the way that you take is right that means that you've set your sights on something and you desire it so much that everything you do to get there is right in your own eyes the ends justify the means as long as you get what you desire then it was right in your eyes because all we're focused on is inwardly. We don't think what other people had to go through for us to get that. We don't think what we had to sacrifice and how that may have affected other people in order for us to get that. So when he says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. The contrast is, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. See, we know that we want it and we won't get it. We never stop to think, well, do I desire the right thing? What's it say that God, God doesn't ponder the ways that you can take? God's all knowing. He knows every which way you can take. He knows every way that you can end up there and every way that you can't. Right? He's omnipresent. That doesn't just mean all places at once. He's in all times at once. Right? He's already in tomorrow waiting on us just like he is here in this service today. Because where two or three are gathered together in his name, he's in the midst. He's just as much in tomorrow as he is here. God doesn't ponder all the ways that you can take. What's he ponder? Your heart. We look at where we want to go. God looks at, well, why do you want to go there? God ponders, well, why do you desire it? Why has this become so important in your life that you're willing to give up daily Bible study to get it? That you're willing to cut into your prayer time every day so that you can have a little bit more time to go out and do this. That you're willing to miss a Wednesday night service or a Sunday night service. Or we just don't need to come to Sunday school no more. Right? He doesn't ponder the way that you take. He already knows where you're at. I mean, if you want his, does he not enjoy you? Are you not the tabernacle of God? He already knows where you're at. He already knows how you got there. He was there the whole time. He ponders your heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance, as God told Samuel. God looketh on the heart. He doesn't just look on your heart, he pondereth it. 
when God looks at you he sees and he knows everything that's going on deep down in your soul in your heart in your mind and he ponders it in other words he looks at every which way to know not only why you do it what led you to get there but God ponders it also to know what it's going to take to convince you that that isn't the right way to go that's what that word conviction means to convince well what's it con it's convincing us that God's right God ponders not just to know well what does he want not just well how did he get there why does he want that but no God says what's it going to take to get him back to where he should be now it don't take God too much pondering he's all knowing right? he's all powerful but truly God spends a whole lot more time thinking about us than we probably do thinking about him God ponders where we should be and how to convince us that we ought to be there how many days we wake up and God's not even the first thought on our mind let alone the 10th or the 20th or the 30th that Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession for us Jesus never stops praying to God the Father for you if you're one of his but truly God cares a whole lot about what's going on in your heart a whole lot more than we think or we stop to realize that God cares about it and then so much more so let's look at verse number 3 he says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice notice our last verse just told us that God ponders the hearts of man regardless of what we think we're right we're wrong what we're doing is justified God looks and ponders at our hearts so then in verse number 3 he says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice keep in mind this is Old Testament economy right this is back when sacrifices should have been a daily thing I'm not saying that it always was but should have been All right, we know Job went out and sacrificed daily that was before the Ten Commandments and everything that was in the time of the patriarchs and he sacrificed for all of his kids in case they forgot to right sacrifice should be a daily thing at this point in time but it says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice I remember what you know Samuel told King Saul obedience greater than sacrifice right well what was Saul's position he didn't do what God said and then tried to spin things around that everything that God told him to kill that he didn't he was going to use it as a sacrifice unto God and the response was obedience greater than sacrifice well here it doesn't say obedience but it says justice and judgment verse number 2 we hear about man's pretty good at convincing himself that he's right but God looks at your heart and instead of doing what we want to do and then coming in every day and saying Lord here's a sacrifice for everything that I know I shouldn't have done but I did it anyway Lord I'm sorry for doing the exact same thing today that I did yesterday and yesterday I told you I repented of it but I went out and I had my heart set on the exact same thing when I left that's not repentance if anything it's making a mockery of God's forgiveness he said confess your sins and he'll forgive you but we know that repentance right the turning from it is true confession right, I love the fact that in the book of 1st John confess your sins eat faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you but you can't be forgiven for something you're not sorry for repentance is Lord I'm purposing not to do it again doesn't mean that you won't do it again but you've purposed it's not going to happen again here we're talking about justice judgment obedience because what does God tell us to be? he tells us to be holy as he is holy can't be holy without justice and judgment can't go out and live as God wants you to live without exercising justice and judgment he says those are more valuable more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice again God knows your heart he knows you're not perfect he knows you're wrapped in this sin cursed flesh 
He knows that one day you will have a body like His where the Spirit and the body will finally look like the Lord's. And then one of these days we're going to be forever seated in heavenly places with Him. Going to look just like Him, be a joint heir. Right? One of these days. But He also knows that right now, that ain't it. we got to wrestle with this thing that is imperfect. But hallelujah, He made us king to rule and reign over this flesh to compel it to do the things that God desires us to do. So He knows your heart. He knows when you mess up and you didn't mean to. And He knows when you messed up and you meant to. He knows when it caught you off guard and when you walked in with both eyes wide open, staring it right in the face and decided to do it anyway. But what's He say? Justice and judgment, more acceptable than sacrifice. Truth is, some people believe that as long as they're sorry for it afterwards, that God's going to forgive them for it. Well, if you repent of it, He'll forgive you. But some people think that there's always a sacrifice, something that they can give up. There's enough tears that they can cry to where it'll be all right in God's eyes. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that man doesn't know what to do good and doeth not to him, it is sin. And you know what sin takes? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Well, you know what it take, took in order for you to get saved? You had to repent and admit that you was wrong. You know when the blood was applied? After you recognized what you were and you asked God to change you. You know what that means? You were intent on not going back to it. Lord, I don't want to be what I am. I want to be what you want me to be. You know what it takes in order to be forgiven of sin? Same thing, repentance. Just because you come in with big old crocodile tears doesn't mean that God forgave you of it. God ponders the hearts. He knows when it's for show. And he also knows when you can barely stay and look at yourself in the mirror because you're under such conviction and guilt of it. And you finally come in and repent of it. And then God puts it under the blood. The blood didn't apply until you've decided that you don't want that a part of you anymore. Because as long as you're clinging on to it, a man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. So what's more acceptable than sacrifice? What's more acceptable than coming in and getting right with God, being right with God beforehand? That obedience greater than sacrifice, justice and judgment more acceptable than sacrifice? What's he saying? If you do the right thing the first time, you don't have this gap where you're wrestling with God on whether you were right or wrong. And there's all these things you could have been doing for God, and then eventually you get it made right. Or you could just do right from the beginning, and all this time you're still living for God. You're still shining a light. You're still going out and witnessing to the world saying, hey, there's a Savior, and He can do for you what He did for me. But see, that whole time, well, we think we're right in our own mind. We're out there, God's trying to convince us that we were wrong. What are we doing? That's time that we'll never get back. Those are souls that may enter into all of eternity that they'll ne never had another opportunity to hear about Jesus. Someone that the door was open and we closed it because we didn't want to, by faith, follow after God. Very serious. So why do you think that God prefers obedience and justice and judgment over sacrifice? Because it's always right to do right. Never right to do wrong and then try and convince God for a week or two days or however long it takes you to finally admit, all right, Lord, you're right and I was wrong. Right, but then our next verse. High look, proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. But what's a high look? That's where you're looking, not at what you are, but either where you want to be or things that you want to look at. A high look means you're not looking where you're at. You're looking somewhere else. I don't have to deal with it. I'm too good for this. It's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, being in this sin cursed flesh. Right? Where were we? We was in the muck in the mire. Right? He reached down into the miry clay. You know where that is? At the lowest of the low. You know what we are outside the grace of God? We just bagging that miry clay. The days that we don't follow, that we don't obey, you know where we're back at? At the worst of the worst. Because if a man's guilty of sin. He's guilty of all the law. Right? There's no 
degrees or shades or anything. Nope. You're either right with God or you're not right with God. But if you're not right with God, where are you? You're useless. Can't be used. So when he says, I look, I'm too good for this. I mean, God was too good for us. But he didn't have a high look. Where did he look? He looked at those that were in need. We can either ignore those that are in need. Most of the time, that's us, by the way. We can either look at where we are needy and say, Lord, help my need. Humility is knowing our strengths and our weaknesses and abiding therein. Lord, I know that I'm able to do this, this, and this because you've trained me, you've equipped me, you've given me the ability to do it. But Lord, I also know I need you all over here on all these other things. I mean, it's a high look. He says, proud heart, we know that pride goes before destruction, haughty spirit before fall. Right? We know that a proud look right, is one of them things that God hates. We know that pride will not only kill your spirituality, pride can kill a whole church's spirituality. It's one of them wedges that the devil can drive in cause a rift in the church. That pride can kill a community. Pride is what brought America to what America is today. Pride is the same doctrine that the devil preached in the garden. That you can become as gods, knowing the difference between good and evil. But yet the Bible says in the last days they'll call that which is evil good and that which is good evil. Just because you learned it doesn't mean that it's true. Just because you rationalize it, again, man's ways are right in his own eyes. Doesn't mean that it's true. But pride is what keeps you from coming to the understanding that God's right and you're wrong. Can I help you with this? God's always right. He's God. So if you sit down and you don't agree with a Bible verse, it's not because God changed what the Bible verse said. It's because something in you changed which caused you to see the Bible verse different. Don't know how we got off on all that. That wasn't in the notes. but Right? And he says in the plowing of the wicked, or what's that? The effort of the wicked the sowing of the wicked why do you plow because you got a line of seeds that you're going to put in what you just plowed a little bit later right it's the effort of putting something in hoping to reap the rewards well the plowing of the wicked does it say that what he's doing is wicked no the bible tells us that we reap what we sow we're supposed to go out and plant we're supposed to go out and be fruitful is that not what he told Adam and Eve when he kicked them out of the garden of Eden be fruitful and multiply. Right? It is God's will that that man doesn't work, you shouldn't eat. Right? We should go out, we should plow. We should labor. We should go out and plant by faith, knowing that God will cause us to reap an increase. Right? Some ten, some a hundredfold. Doesn't matter. That's up to God. All that we know is we're supposed to go out and we're supposed to plant. Some plant, some water, what happens? God gives the increase. Right? It's true whether you're talking about your physical self, your spiritual self, whether we're talking about the gospel or the ministry, it is always right in God's eyes for you to go out and labor right, by faith, believing that God wants you to do so that God can do something more than we're able to do. Well, he says the plowing of the wicked. Well, he's doing what God intended him to do, but what's he? Into? he hadn't put a seed in the ground yet. When plowing, you're just getting the dirt ready. You're tearing up the old roots. You're getting the things that died in the ground last year. You're getting rid of that. You're churning it all up, turning it into fertilizer for what's going in the ground this year. Right? You can't plant unless you plow first. Well, you can, but go read the parable of the sower and the seed. If you don't plow and you don't get them rocks and them weeds up out of the ground, what happens? They don't take root and they get choked out by the weeds and they never... Fruit, you know, grow into fruition to where they actually have fruit. Well, he says the plowing of the wicked is a sin. If your desires, if your intents, if when God tries your heart and he ponders it and he realizes that all the effort that you're putting in isn't following the order that, again, doesn't say that what he's doing is wicked says that he's the one that is wicked and he's plowing. If you're not right with God, what's that make you? Well, rebellions is the sin of witchcraft. What's witchcraft? Wicked. 
If you're not right with God, what are we? We're wicked. What is sin? It's wickedness. What were we conceived in? Sin. What were we born in? Sin. What were we by nature and by choice before God saved us? Sinners. Well, when we revert back to that state, we're wicked. Right? Either holy or you're wicked. Why do you think he said be holy? Because he's holy. He don't want you to be wicked. Right? But he says the plowing of the wicked. When you're not right with God, you may be going out and doing something that God desires you to do, but if you do it with the wrong spirit, even though you're doing the right thing, if you do it with the wrong heart, according to God, it's sin. Just because you go out and, you know, on visitation, hang tracks, tape, CDs, nowadays, I'm, QR codes to our YouTube page, whatever it is, right? But just because you go out and you are doing something that you know is right, if you do it with the wrong heart, God doesn't see what it is that you're doing. What you're doing may be right. He's more concerned about how you are while you do it. What state are you in? I wish I could say every time I get up here, I've got a clear, you know, my, sometimes I'm still thinking about the people I wanted to run off the road on the way in because they're driving like crazy, right? But I can honestly say that when I get up here at my heart, I always try to be completely open, honest with God. Don't want to get up here with something between me and God and then try and do something that God wants me to do that only I can do with God's help. Right? But, right, we all know that, that we're, we're in church. We're where we're supposed to be. We're listening to good singing and preaching. We're where we're supposed to be at to worship God on the Lord's day. But yet we know that there's something deep down in here that's keeping us from doing what God wants us to do the right way. It's not about where you're at. It's not about what you're doing. It's how your heart is while you're doing it. Little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Right? Well, a little bit of wickedness in what you're doing, what's that make it? Wicked. Sometimes God winks at our ignorance. If you don't know that what you're doing isn't right with God, God may wink at it till the one day that he brings it to you. Right? We all go back to the example of Noah. Noah didn't know that the grape juice on the ark for some six months and, you know, even more than that while the water was drying out and ground hadn't, you know, went from mud to actual something you could walk on. Right? However long that that grape juice was on the shelf, he didn't know that it had fermented and turned into wine. Right? God didn't hold Noah's intoxication again. Why? Because he didn't know. But after that, Noah knew we ain't doing that no more. But if it's worth drinking, let's drink it the day that we juice it. Well, if you don't know, God may wink at your ignorance. But if you know, again, no good and do it not. Sin. So really what I want to teach on this morning is in verse number four, or verse number three, sorry. Those two words, justice and judgment. It says justice and judgment more valuable, more acceptable than sacrifice. Well, what is sacrifice? Sacrifice is admitting to God that you were wrong. And then, as works meet for repentance, you're bringing something. Now, in olden times, right, it was an animal. Might have been a peace offering. Right, might have been one of those fragrances that they used to burn inside the temple of God. But you were bringing something to show that you were sorry. But what's that nowadays? Most of the time, that is in your heart. The guilt that you're bringing and saying, Lord, I give this over to you because I'm sorry. Right? It's in your heart knowing that you disappointed a thrice holy God and that he cares enough about you to show you that you were wrong and you come because you know that you disappointed God, want to admit that you're wrong to get things made right with the one that you love more than anything in the world. What is that? That's sacrifice. Right? In truth, it's humility. Right, it's turning over that prideful nature and asking the Lord to break us like he broke the heart of Pharaoh. Right, God hardened Pharaoh's heart until what? Until it broke. But Lord, break me so that I don't turn into Pharaoh. Lord, I understand that, you know, my rashness, my brashness, all those things that, you know, the Bible teaches we shouldn't be like and we should be Christ-like. Lord, I understand still got a little bit of that in me. Lord, here it is. I'm giving it over to you and asking you to change me. What is it? That's the, 
That's a New Testament form of sacrifice. When it says that justice and judgment are more acceptable than sacrifice, God's not talking about your pocketbook. I mean, is that a form of sacrifice? Maybe, but, you know, tithing's a form of worship. That's not sacrifice. That's a benefit that we get to take part in. Right? He's not talking about your time. Because that's not necessarily a sacrifice. That? That's you getting to do something for God. That's an investment. Now, I understand there's only so many hours in the day, and you've got to choose what you're going to put your time into. But is it a sacrifice? No, those are choices. When he says sacrifice, what he's talking about is sacrificing of your flesh. New Testament sacrifice is saying, Lord, take more of the old man, turn it into the new creature. Lord, I give up this part of me that I'm so attached to because it's been with me since I was you know, born. But Lord, take this and replace it with more of you. That's the sacrifice. I mean, I've said it before. We'll say it again probably. Maybe next week. Who knows? Right? Jesus said, take up my cross. Take up your cross. Follow me. Well, Jesus had a cross and he only used it on one day. So why did he tell us to take us ours with us? Because we need a place to put that old man, the flesh. Nail him down. Apostle Paul said, I die daily. What's he doing? He's crucifying the flesh on that cross and he's taking it with him. Because he's stuck with the flesh, but as long as he's got his cross with him, he's got a place to keep the flesh. Right? Well, what's that daily sacrifice? Lord, take this part of me that I can't na nail down. It's too strong for me. Right? And you nail it down. That's sacrifice. Because what are you giving up? Yourself. What did God ask for? God didn't ask for your wallet. He didn't ask for your calendar. God didn't ask for your emotions, right, or your worship. What did he purchase off the sin, or the auction block of sin? He purchased you. Amen. So when it says that justice and judgment are more acceptable than sacrifice, what does God want? God wants all of us because he gave all of his son to purchase all of us. But instead of having to come to God and say, Lord, this part of me that's wicked and it's you know, running rampant in my life, I give it to you and I ask you to nail it down. You know what's more acceptable than that? Which is what God desires for us. He wants us to be like him. He says, you know what's more acceptable than that? Instead of always looking at all the ways that you don't meet up to God's expectation, because we're not Christ, and outside of that new body that we talked about, we're not going to be like Christ. That's why he sealed us with the Holy Spirit, so that our soul would be as it was the day that he saved us, and he wouldn't have to resave us. But that part of us is sealed, because that's what's going to go into that new body and make us like him, that new creature. But, well, he says, you know what's better than sacrifice? focusing on all the ways that we're not like and begging God to change it he says that's acceptable but he says you know what's more acceptable justice and judgment but what's justice justice is doing right pretty simple definition it's as simple as I can get it down to but justice is also knowing the difference between right and wrong and choosing to do good Instead of focusing on all the ways that I'm not what God wants me to be, you know what justice is? Justice is saying, I know that that's not what God wants me to be, but I choose to be what God wants me to be. I can look at all the ways that I'm not, all the ways that I can't, all the ways that I'm not enough to do what God wants me to do, or I can look at, this is what I can do, and I know that's what God wants me to do. When you choose justice... You know what you're saying? Lord, I choose you over looking at all the things that I'm not. Instead of looking at how I'm not enough, I'm going to look at how God is enough. When you've got your eyes set on what you can do, you know what God starts doing in your life? He starts taking them things that aren't good enough, and he starts working on them in the shadows. Instead of having to wait for you to get all broken and feeling guilty for all the ways that you're not what... God wants you to be, just do what God's already given you to be able to do for him. Choose justice, and guess what he does? He works those things out in the shadow. Well, Lord, I've never done that before. Well, by faith, you did this today. Just follow it, do justice tomorrow. God's going to work on them things. Did he not promise that he would finish in us the thing that he started when he saved us? 
You know what that means? He's going to take all the things that aren't what they need to be, he's going to make them into what they need to be. Instead of saying, Lord, well, can we do that today? You're just focusing on doing, Lord, I know this is right, and I'm going to do right. Lord, I may not be what I will be one of these days, but I, you made me into enough that I can know when it's right to do right, and we're just going to do right. Justice is choosing that, Lord, even though by my carnal senses, it makes sense to do this. Or I can understand, I can rationalize how we'll get to where I desire to be if we take this path. Justice is saying, Lord, I know that by faith is the only way to please you. And even though I can understand how this or this or this or this might take me, that makes sense to the flesh. Lord, I know that by faith, this is the way you want me to take. And even though it don't make sense, and my flesh is fighting me every inch of the way, we're going to do the right thing, and we're going to choose faith. That's justice. Justice, not just doing the right thing, it's doing it for the right reasons and doing it the right way. Again, the plowing of the wicked is sin. You can go the way that God wants you to take, but unless you do it by faith, it's not justice. I mean, this is the example that came to head off. Came, right? It's wrong to speed. Right? We know that. What happens if you go speed? Well, if you don't do it all the time, you may get a fine. Right? But if the first time we caught somebody speeding, right, we went out and cut off the foot that they used to make the gas pedal move, the question is, is that just, was it, did they break the law? Yes. Are we going to keep them from speeding? Maybe. But did we do it in a way that was just? No. Right? Did we perform justice? I would argue no. Right? Well, you can do the right thing the wrong way. You can go out in a, you know, fit of anger and frustration and say well fine I'm going to go do what God wants me to do you're not doing it the way God wants it to be done you can go make up the heads and stand in the gap but if in the way that you made up the heads there's still gaps there that's not the way that God wanted it to be done God wants the hedge made up to where there's no way to get through anymore right well I'll go out and tell somebody about Jesus well if you do it in the attitude that some of y'all come in church I wouldn't want to hear you talk about Jesus Right? No, how are we supposed to go tell about Jesus the way that Jesus would want us to go and tell about him? The way that he came and told us about the will of the Father. Right? Well, that's justice. What's judgment? Judgment's using what God put in you to discern what God wants you to do. Truly, judgment is just listening to the Holy Ghost and saying, all right, Lord, that's what true judgment is. Judgment is getting into the Word of God and saying, Lord, show me what I need to know so that when I come to that trial, without hesitation, I can say, well, that's what the Lord wants us to do. That's what we're going to do. Judgment is knowing what the will of God is. How long do you think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood there before Nebuchadnezzar and said, well, we talked about it for about 30 minutes and we have now decided that it's right to do what God... No, there was no hesitation. We are not careful to answer the old king. He said, we ain't bound down to your whatever this is supposed to be that kind of looks like you, by the way, right? No, it's right to serve God. We're going to serve God. And our God is able to deliver, but if not, even if he chooses to let us die, we're still not bound down and worshiping you. That wasn't a judgment that they had to, you know, work up the willpower to come to at that point. Not a long time before that, right back when them and Daniel was there with the chief eunuch, what they decide? We ain't eating all that unclean food. Just give us a whole bunch of, you know, bean soup, basically. Right? And we're going to live according to what God said we should live. And then in the end, you'll see that God will reward our faith. Long before they ever got to that statue and said, we ain't bound down to it, they would purposed in their heart that it's always right to judge according to what God judges. What's judgment? Knowing what God wants you to do. What's justice? Executing that. Truly, judgment, you will have to get in this word of God, which is, has a looking glass. 
right, and say, Lord, use this sharp two-edged sword to shave off the things of me that you don't want. Show me what's in your will and what's out of your will, and then justice is saying, Lord, get rid of it. Is it any wonder that justice and judgment are more acceptable than sacrifice? Because you're asking God, Lord, take those things before I act on them and remove them from my life. Right, judgment is looking at the food that was put down on the plate and saying, that looks like mold. We're not eating that. Justice is saying, well, that isn't, you know, that ain't healthy. And if that's not healthy, chances are all this aren't healthy. Judgment's being able to look and say, Lord, even though that path looks dangerous, even though I can't see over the other hill, even though I don't know all the ways it's going to take us, you said that's the right path, we're going to take that right path. Justice is not just saying, well, all right, Lord, we'll go down that way. Justice is saying, Lord, I'm going to make sure I'm prepared before we take the path. Take everything that I need with us, that you've equipped me with, so that no matter what happens on the way by faith, you've equipped me to handle whatever we encounter. But it's not very good judgment to get into a car that doesn't have any gas and try and take a family vacation. That's not good judgment. Especially when the thing keeps beeping at you every three seconds, right? Low gas, low gas, low gas. Now we'll be all right. God gave you enough common sense to know car need gas. No gas, no go. Right? Hopefully, because you work a job that God gave you, right? God's been good enough to, you've got money, put gas in car. Right, but if you purpose, well, instead of using that money on gas, we're going to use that to do this, that, or the other, that's not executing judgment. Right, because you know what all them things are? That's all that, and all this will be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I'm more concerned about taking the path that we ought to go, making sure that we stay on the path, we don't go off-roading, right, hit a ditch, Making sure that regardless of what happens, we've got what it takes to either fix a flat, right, to hook a rope up around a tree and pull ourselves out of a ditch with the winch. Right? We've got what it takes in order to make sure that we're on the path for you. So, Lord, help us remove those things that are going to hinder us. Right? Sacrifice is saying, Lord, I'm real sorry about what I did, and here's proof that I am sorry. That's repentance. You know what's better than that? Just from the get-go. Lord, I know that I'm not what you want me to be. If nothing else, because I know that I'm still on this earth. But I haven't attained unto everything that you've reserved for me in heaven. And Lord, out of sincerity, right? not just saying, well, Lord, show me where I, I can improve. But no, Lord, it bothers me that I'm not the image of your son yet. Right? It hurts me that I'm not, in your eyes, everything that I can be. So help change me into what I can be more like your son. Right? Lord, I understand that there are things that I do still that hurt the heart of God. That bring to remembrance to Christ the pain of having them nails driven through his hands, through his feet. Having that spear thrust through his side. Right? There are things that I do today that I'm still guilty of doing just as much as the day that I got saved. Lord, that bothers me. Because I desire to be something different. You know what that is? That's executing judgment. Saying, Lord, I'm not enough. Christ is enough, but I'm not. I know I need to be more like Christ. But that's not a simple math problem. Right? Well, how do I need to be? I don't know. I know that Jordan does not equal Christ. Well, what do we need to work on today? Well, I could give you a whole laundry list. Right? We'd be here till the end of the year, and then some probably. It's not my job to figure out what the Lord wants to work on today. It's the desire to say, Lord, change me into what I need to be. Instead of focusing on all the things that I do wrong, Lord, I'm going to focus on what I can do, which is justice, doing the right thing, and Lord, I'm going to leave the rest in your hands by faith because he's the potter and I'm the clay.
I don't know what I need to be. I just know that I need to be something else than what I am. I know that in his hands, I'll become that. I know that through enough time, through enough fire, through enough heat, eventually he'll make me into that vessel of honor for his honor and his glory. But in the meantime, I understand the only th way that I'm bringing honor and glory unto him is through obedience. It's through doing justice. And you may be able to hoodwink me. You may be able to hoodwink your spouse, hoodwink pastor, hoodwink everybody at the job, hoodwink everybody in your life. But God pondereth the heart. I mean, we know, and I sense fear. What they do? They did the right thing, but they did it for the wrong reason. What happened? Their life was required of them that day. We have examples in the Bible of those that knew what to do. They didn't do it. Didn't fool God. Didn't catch God by surprise. Why? Because He pondereth your heart. In truth, if you're still doing the right thing for the wrong reason, it's because you think you can steal something from God. Because why else would you labor in the house of God if it wasn't for God's glory? Because you think you can get something out of it. Very dangerous thing to think that you can take what belongs to God and claim it as your own. You know what mercy means? You didn't deserve it. You know what grace means? You got something other than what you deserved. Everything that we get from God isn't because we earned it, isn't because we deserved it. It's because He decided to give it to us because He loved us. But to think that we can claim something just by laboring or investing our time or our effort or our energy, you know, that, that's blasphemy towards God. Saying that we can earn the favor of God. That's why the devil got kicked out of heaven. He thought he could work to get to a spot where he deserved to sit on the throne of Christ. Ain't going to happen. You can't labor to become what you need to be for God. That takes an act of God to change that which is unholy and turn it into holy. If you could labor and become something that God approved of, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. Judgment is saying, Lord, keep me humble enough to understand that there's still more you need to work on. But judgment also is saying, Lord, give me enough sense that I know what is right and what is wrong so that I can execute judgment. Do justice. Judgment's looking in the mirror and saying, Lord, I know that's not holy, that's not holy, that's not holy. So Lord, change it. And then turning around, walking out the door that day and saying, Lord, show me which way I ought to take. Give me discernment. Give me enough sense from your word and through the Holy Ghost, which what? Leads and guides us into all truth. Lord, I'm just by faith, based off of what your word says and based on the direction of your spirit, I'm just going to do all that I can understand is in your perfect will to do. Is that an easy process? No. But it's more acceptable than sacrifice. Does God expect you to be perfect? No, because when it dawns on you that Jesus not only shed the blood that it would take to save you the first time that you, know, you bowed before him and said, Lord, forgive me of my sins, he also shed the blood that it'd take for every time that you came to him afterwards and said, Lord, I'm sorry that I sinned. Please forgive me again. God knew how much blood it not only took to save you, but keep you saved. And that's how much blood Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. God knew that you wouldn't be perfect. But he also knew that you could be what he desired you to be, which is acceptable and presentable in a vessel of honor unto God. The two are not mutually exclusive. You can be what God wants you to be in this sin-cursed flesh. You've just got to choose to put on that robe as a priest to that crown, as a king that he talks about over in Revelation, and choose to rule and reign over your flesh in judgment to do justice. Long before Solomon ever heard about this plan called salvation, right when he died, he went down into Abraham's bosom, right? You know what, God, when Jesus showed up, Jesus started preaching about Jesus to all the Old Testament saints that need to be saved like we are. Right? You know what he started talking about? He said, hey, Solomon, you remember when I talked to you about justice and judgment? He says, you know what it takes to live a life that's pleasing unto God? It still takes justice and judgment. His ways change not. 
Right? God's only expectation from the beginning was what? Holiness. And was obedience. He said, eat not of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Later on, they changed it. Don't know if it was Adam telling it to Eve or whether it was Eve remembering it wrong in her head not to touch it or eat of it. That she surely die. Well, that's not what God said, but what did God say? Just don't do it. That was it. You can teach everything else is yours, just not that one. Adam was supposed to tend to how can you tend the garden if you don't touch the tree that needs to be tended? Anyway. That's things that Jordan argues about with himself all the time. Anyway. Right, but the point was what God expected from the beginning. Holiness, which is what he made them, and obedience. You know what God will accept? Sacrifice. But you know what he desires? Justice and judgment. It's more acceptable. Yeah, we can always, you know, hallelujah, by the grace of God, there's always a place that we can bow and we can confess our sins, we can repent. We can get things made right with God, but it's His desire that we never have the need to. Is that feasible? I don't know. I'm working on it. If I ever get there, I'll let you know. Right? But in the meantime, you know what there's always more room for? Judgment and justice. The less time that we have to spend sacrificing, you know what that is? It's more that we can be busy about the Father's business. When we're invested in His business, you know what that is? We're not plowing with the heart of the wicked. No, we're out there laboring for the Lord. We know that His word never returns void. My efforts, they come to naught all the time. There are things I put in the ground, they never come up again. They's dead before we put them in the ground. So of course they weren't going to grow. But everything in the labor of the Lord, He promised that there's always going to be fruit abounding on our account. He didn't promise that we'd be the ones to see the fruit. But he did promise that if we go out and we do what he tells us with the spirit in the heart that he tells us to go out and go in, he promised there'd be a reward. That we'd be laying up gold, silver, and precious gems in heaven, not wood, hay, and stubble. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.